What's going on everybody? Thanks for tuning in. My name is Kaylin. Welcome to my channel. Today's video essay is going to be about comedy and the state of comedy, particularly comedians and whether or not uh, comedians are the new philosopher kings and queens of today. I've been watching a lot of comedy lately and there's a lot of good uh, comedians on YouTube, on Netflix, doing a lot of specials and a lot of really interesting work as commentators on social issues that affect all of us today. So this piece, it's available on Medium, it's available on my Substack. I'll post links to the article in the description box so that you can check it out at your own time. Comedians, the new philosopher kings and queens. Wit, it's the undeniable tell of a great comic. Andrew Schultz, Dave Chappelle, Akash Singh, Matt Wright, Patrice O'Neill, RIP. Cat Williams, Ali Wong, Leah Sampson, Shane Gillis, Joe Rogan, Louis C.K., Bill Burr, Jimmy Yang, and countless comedians in the modern era are lifting moves and dazzling minds the world over. If you're unfamiliar with the work of these modern jesters, you're sleeping, as an abundance of their comedic masterworks can be found on every popular streaming and social platform. You have only to pick your pleasure. Comedians today are a kind of new street philosopher class. To my mind, they stand next to conscious rappers on the artistic spectrum. Comedy shouldn't be used as an alternative to studying the work of scholars and diving deep for information and solutions to our social problems, but it can and should accompany the serious scholar in their search for answers to life's more perplexing problems. What makes the comic so fascinating is the beauty of their mind. Whether it's the brass, fearless, in-your-face delivery of Andrew Schultz, or the smooth, calm, and collected narrative with a punch at the end that describes Dave Chappelle, the best comics are all magnificent at asking us to think about our assumptions. Ari Shafir's 2022 stand-up special, Jew, is just one example of how a comedian can use his mind to remind us of the absurdity of life. Offensive as some of the content in this special is, by the end of it, you've been made to laugh at your social conventions and hard held beliefs around Judaism and Jewish culture. After listening to Ari for a few minutes, you can tell that he could have gone in any field of work. His mind is bright and his wit is piercing. Dave Chappelle, known for his crafty, witty storytelling, invites us in specials like The Closer to entertain red button topics like human sexuality and race. He's seen the dark side of Hollywood and after a highly publicized period of tribulation with entertainment industry elites has resolved to be a fearless cultural commentator. In Chappelle's 2019 special Sticks and Stones, he challenges society's thinking on abortion saying, I'm not for or against abortion, but women should be allowed to abort a child if they want. It's a woman's choice to do what she wants with her body. However, if you ladies decide to have the baby, a man should not have to pay. Later, he adds, if you can kill this MF, I can at least abandon him. Chappelle's line of reasoning first appears to side exclusively with women. He then flips the logic of sex equality on its head and asserts that men also have an equally valid perspective on the pro-life, pro-choice conversation. The above examples demonstrate how witty and incisive comics can give us penetrating and nuanced commentary on the pink elephants in our social spaces. One of the more noticeable examples of this cutting social commentary is Andrew Schultz. To be fair, he's a different breed of comedian altogether, an amalgamation of Richard Pryor, Patrice O'Neill, and Rodney Dangerfield. Crowd work, the comedian's freestyle. Schultz has an ability to see the ironies in life and bring them to bear on his audiences, sometimes at their own expense, but always in good fun. Schultz has become legendary for his no holds barred approach to offending individuals and groups. There probably isn't a guy alive today more comfortable with teasing crowds than Schultz, except for maybe Nate Jackson, Matt Reif, and Ari Spears. The latter three have all made great waves in the last few years doing improv comedy, something called crowd work in the comedy sphere. If you've never experienced a lot of electric energy of a comedy doing crowd work, there's just nothing like it. Crowd work is the ability to take cues from the audience to make jokes on the spot. The magic of crowd work is that it is unrehearsed. Comics use their quick wits to dish on topics, which often are drummed up by the crowd. Ralph Barbosa, a young comic with an unassuming intellect, has a great knack for staying calm under pressure and delivering great comedy bits based on word association games he plays with his audiences. The ability to think on the spot is also required in battle rap. One battle rapper is pitted against another, and with or without music, the two are tasked with forming clever words and ideas into punchlines and references such that they outwit their competition. As with comedy crowd work, the wonder and amazement of battle rap is in the realization that participants are improving what they say on the spot. The same magic present in instrumental jazz improv is present here. Comedy and historical reckoning. Comedy hasn't always received a positive reception. John Muriel, 
renowned philosopher and humor and professor emeritus of religious studies, reminds us that, in fact, the old Greek philosophers, Plato, Epictetus, Aristotle, and others, saw comedy and humor, or more specifically laughter, as a sign of scorn and mockery. Plato was one of history's staunchest critics of laughter, for laughter's sake, and denounced it as a social convention. He wrote, quote, the ridiculous is a certain kind of evil, specifically a vice, end quote, and quote, for ordinarily, when one abandons himself to violent laughter, his condition provokes a violent reaction, end quote. Plato saw laughter and comedy in general as antithetical to self-control and right living, along with many of the Stoics who prided themselves on equanimity of mind state and not allowing external stimuli to dictate their mood. Ultimately, these thinkers saw comedy as a breeder of delusion and self-ignorance. Aristotle didn't see comedy to be as destructive as Plato. He saw witty banter in the course of finding truth to be very valuable. However, in keeping with Plato, he did promote the idea that most comedy was a sign of scorn and mockery. He felt the better that some forms of jesting be outlawed, as in jesting against political figures and heads of state. Why we laugh. Have you ever asked yourself why we laugh? It probably seems so natural to you that you never asked yourself this question. There are three main theories that have been put forth on what causes us to laugh. I'm only going to give a cursory summary of these theories, but I'll leave a link in the description box for those who want to do a more exhaustive analysis on them. The first is superiority theory. The idea is that we laugh as a result of feeling superior to others or over a former version of ourselves. This theory has been debunked since we don't only laugh when making fun of other people. Sometimes we laugh at a humorous picture or at a funny saying. Additionally, we can laugh at ourselves for forgetting where we place our keys only to find them in our pocket. In the latter case, there is no one to feel superior to. The second is called relief theory. Its main proponent was Freud, who believed that we laugh to relieve pent up nervous energy. He saw laughter as a channel to rid the body of repressed sexual energy, which could be used to commit undesirable acts towards one's fellow men. This theory has been debunked as well. Though there is certainly a physical release of energy that accompanies laughing, it is mainly due to the contracting and expansion of various muscle groups in the respiratory system, not the need to release repressed sexual energy. In other words, one could voluntarily force themselves into a laughing spell, <laughs> irrespective of an internal desire to release pent up energy. See what I mean? The final explanation, and it is the one still subscribed to today, is called incongruity theory. It says that we laugh when we perceive something to be incongruous, something that violates our mental patterns and expectations. When we sense an irony, we are likely to laugh. An example would be the sighting of a presumably unaware nude old man or lady walking down a busy city street. We might be inclined to laugh because the image serves as a violation of what we would deem to be normal. Immanuel Kant, the 18th century philosopher, didn't subscribe to a pro or anti-comedy platform. Instead, he felt it better to analyze comedy and laughter for their effects on individuals and society. Indeed, he was more concerned with how and why comedy functioned as it did among populations. He reasoned that irony and phenomenal absurdities followed by an unexpected resolution of the absurdities were the foundations for laughter. For example, when comedian Leah Sampson comments in her Don't Tell Comedy stand-up performance Why Women Should Be President that she's a fan of stereotypes, immediately two absurdist elements present themselves. One, Sampson's comment about stereotypes, and two, any number of potential stereotypes she claims to be a fan of. She resolves these two elements humorously by saying, especially when they get me out of drive, the punch being that women can't drive. The takeaway. We laugh because there is irony in purposely deciding to become the fool. Comedians are our brave court jesters. Without them, society might be further along, Plato and some of the early Stoics might argue. But then again, we might be much further behind if not for laughter. It is often a laugh that prevents us from turning to some of our more negative impulses. I'm sure you can remember a time when a good laugh lightened your mood and helped you to see the bright side of a problem. Or perhaps that no problem existed at all. The wit necessary to craft the jokes that force laughter from our bellies often surpasses our own. While we spend good money to experience comedians, very few of us are okay with clearly being less intelligent than they are. The comic knows this. He knows the king, or the paying audience, doesn't want to feel like a fool. And so, as consolation for the comic being more clever than we, the comic takes pity on us and makes us laugh. Ah, we say in smug approval, what a clown. But it's always the comic who has the last laugh. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Please be sure to share, like, subscribe. And until next time, peace.